All right, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, welcome. It's really a great day for the department and the institution to have someone of Dr. Brown's caliber here to shed some light on things that we still are very unclear about as far as how the anesthetic agents work and their effect on the brain. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Leon Isimides and his lovely wife, Fascia, for helping arrange this, as, as well as the administrative staff, faculty, residents, CRNAs for allowing the residents to get out, helping the residents get out, and the Shaws. The Shaw Foundation funded this endeavor, and really without their generosity, this wouldn't take place. So I'm going to now turn the mic over to our Chancellor, Dr. Thank Barish. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Fox. and. Uh, before I talk a little bit about our wonderful uh, guest speaker today, I would like to thank Dr. Fox and all the faculty here for all that you do for LSU. And uh, I know we, we really appreciate it, and uh, we can't thank you enough. So thank you on behalf of this institution. So when I looked at uh, you know Dr. Brown's CV, <laughs> and then the shortened uh, element of the CV, I figured if I kept introducing him, we'd probably be here for 20 minutes, all right? So this is as about as short an introduction as he's probably ever received, but I know that uh, they want to hear your lecture and ultimately questions. So a little bit, Dr. Emery N. Brown, MD, PhD, is the Warren M. Zappel Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Anybody heard of Harvard here? So there you go. Harvard Medical School and the Edward Hurd Taplin Professor of Medical Engineering and Computational Neurosciences at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The recipient of 2015 Excellence in Research Award by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Now, this is something I want you to take home this next sentence. Dr. Brown is a member of three branches of the National Academies, which are the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Engineering. He is the first African-American and the first anesthesiologist to be elected to all three branches. So how about a, a clap for that? <laughs> a couple, couple other things before he comes up and gives you uh, the lecture. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude in applied mathematics from Harvard College, an MA and PhD in statistics from Harvard University, an MD magna cum laude from Harvard Medical School. Internship in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Children Res and Residency in Anesthesiology at the MGH. His lecture today is the Clinical Neurosciences of Anesthesiology, Research, Education, and Patient Care. Thank you, sir. So thank Dr. Barish, he had to dash out there to uh, Dr. Fox and also to Leon and uh, his wife Vasya for making all this possible. It's certainly a pleasure for me to talk to you about this work because it's what we do basically. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's basically what we do as far as we take care, of, as far as taking care of patients. And kind of the sub-theme from it is it's like really taking it seriously and really looking at what we, what we do when we practice anesthesia. So everything I'm going to talk about today, with, the, with the maybe one or two exceptions, are going to be examples taken from the operating room and then trying to understand basically what's going on under anesthesia. So these are the points that I want to make. I want to make clear that we can get an insight and understand how the neural circuits of where the drugs are acting to produce these states of altered arousal. I want to show you how that appears in the EEG signatures, that they relate to these mechanisms, how you can actually use this to track the state of patients under anesthesia. And also, I want to show you um, a little bit about how this changes with age. And then at the end, I'm just going to say two sentences about a new paradigm. You know, we anesthetize patients, you know, why not bring the brain back after anesthesia? And so here is just some disclosures, and the one thing which I will mention is some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about for monitoring uh, have been licensed by Massimo, and I've served as a consultant for, for Massimo. 
So to begin, um, this is a definition of general anesthesia. So a drug-induced reversible state which involves unconsciousness, amnesia, analgesia, akinesia. And we realize that this is where we make our money as anesthesiologists because we maintain physiological control. Now this is something which we, we hear very often and this is what, you know, this is what Dr. Fox was referring to that we, we have the sense that we don't really understand how anesthesia works. So before we do any research work, I just want to just show you a little video. And I've shown this video before, but it, it illustrates, um, I think, uh, some very straightforward points that we can in, use to interpret how the drugs are acting in the brain. So I'm just going to play this. This is a gentleman who's 68 years old. And uh, he's come to the hospital. He's come to the hospital because he's going to have an umbilical hernia repair. So he wasn't my patient. One Friday afternoon, Eric and I just decided we're going to go over and just film what happens to someone under anesthesia when we lose consciousness. So this is something we see every day. There's nothing fancy here. And he's going to get propofol, just an infusion of propofol. But before we start, I'm going to have him do a few things with a few exam things. I'm going to have him track my finger first. So here he goes, tracking my finger. Okay. And now let me just check one other thing. And I'm going to turn his head. So I'm just going to turn your head. Just let me turn it, okay? You don't have to. I'm going to turn Yeah, there we go. I'm going to turn your head. So I'm just checking his doll's eye reflex, right? You know, so you turn the head this way, the eyes go the other way. So just a, a very sort of standard brain stem exam, right? And then one other thing here. We're just going to show you one last thing. Okay. I'm going to pull down your glove. So just showing you he has normal motor strength. He's not weak at baseline. Okay. So right here, we're just going to pre-oxygenate. Breath in, and then forcefully blow it out. Deeper in. Breath, as deep as you can, and blow out. So I want you to just watch it. So I'm going to have him track my finger. And right here, where the words came on, where the words came on the screen, he got a bolus of propofol. We gave him a... A, uh, a bolus of about 150 milligrams of propofol. If you can no longer do it, I want you to tell me. You tell me if you can no longer do it. This is fantastic. Just keep going. It, it's through a 22 gauge IV. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now watch what happens to his eyes. So they stop in the midline. He blinks. Sir? Sir, can you hear me? She flicks his lash, okay? I'm just going to give you a deep breath here, okay? Now watch. So now they're, you see he has no doll's eyes. So they're doll's eyes are lost, now his eyes are fixed in the midline. He's unresponsive and he's, he's actually not breathing. You can hear the, 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 the pulse oximeter so you know that he's, uh, he's alive, right? But watch his arm. Okay, okay. So his arm's like spaghetti, all right? Now, I don't have his EEG, all right? But I want to show you one other thing before we start talking some details here. So this is another lady that I was taking care of. She's 62 years old. She's coming for thyroid surgery, okay? We're going to do the same thing. I'm going to give her a bolus of propofol. I want to show you what the EEG looks like because we want to put those, these two pictures together. And this is something that I want you to carry away as sort of a synthesis. So four leads of EEG just here on the front of the head. They're the ground and, the, and the, uh, the reference are sitting right in the center. So I'm just going to play this, okay? And uh, so she's going to get propofol. Those are eye blinks if you've never seen, watched them on the EEG. So she's going to get propofol also. And you can tell when it starts going in because you're going to see like a lot of muscle artifact because you know it burns it and it's in a small vein. So it's, she's going to do this, right? You see that? See that right there? It's burning. So she's, she's tensing up. And there's the EMG indicator, right? She's tensing up. And this is actually good because it creates noise. You, so you can really tell when the drug takes effect on her. Look at that. See, how, see, see that? Across all the leads. Now watch what happens right here. See how it started to change? I'm going to freeze it right there. You see that? See this oscillation? This is a beta oscillation. All right? 
it goes up and down about 12 to 16 times in a second. Just went right into that state, right? This is the drug, it's just touching the cortex now. Now watch what happens next. Boom, slow oscillations, big slow oscillations. Watch it, they gave him bigger. I'll stop it right there, you see those? So that's this drug, it's passing right by the brainstem there. Big, the bolus which we gave him. And watch what happens next. She goes into burst suppression. So it's suppressed, boom, there's the burst. See that? So she's at one of the deepest states of anesthesia, just like that. And this is probably typically what happens with all of our patients when we just do a bolus induction, particularly on our, old, on our older patients. This is, this is what happens. So let's just go over a little anatomy, just to remind you of a couple things, so we can make some inferences about what is going on here, even without doing any research, all right? So I put this up here because this is how blood makes it up to the brain, at least the brain stem anyway. So these are the two, basilar, these are the two vertebral arteries. They, they fuse and form the basilar artery. And they're sitting right here, and they're running along the underside of the brain. And they run right here, right? Right along this area here. So what's one of the first things that they hit when you get to the, when it passes by the medulla here? You hit the ventral respiratory group and the dorsal respiratory group. Now, if you've never looked at this, this is a network that's made up of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And so what does propofol do? Propofol enhances GABAergic inhibition. And these neurons have their GABAergic. So if you give a drug which is basically going to act here, you're going to stop breathing. All right? So it makes sense that you would stop breathing. And then as the drug goes further up, up here, I've drawn this in a color-coded fashion. And this is something I didn't realize until just a few years ago. And, I, and the color scheme is drawn on purpose. See how I have the guys in the middle being blue? And this guy in the front here is green, and that guy in the back is green. So just like in the periphery, you have sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, there's a very similar arrangement to the nuclei here. See, the monoaminergic nuclei kind of lie right in the middle. The cholinergic nuclei that release acetylcholine are here in the front and the back. So these guys release the different monoaminergic transmitters, locus ceruleus, norepinephrine, dorsal raphe, serotonin, ventral paraqueductal gray, dopamine, histamine coming from the tuberomarinary nucleus. So there's a very similar arrangement. There's, it's two and a half because technically there's another excitatory transmitter which is, which is orexin which is released by a lateral hypothalamus. We'll tuck that away for the moment. The key part is, you see this area here, the, the, the preoptic area? The preoptic area of the hypothalamus is like my wrist. And it has projections which come down onto each one of these nuclei. So if my fingers are those projections coming down to each one of those nuclei, those projections are GABAergic. All right? So what happens? The propofol hits here. It hits those GABAergic circuits. And how do you know when it has its effect? Well, you saw when the guy's eyes fixed in the midline. If you look on the monitor right then, you see the big slow waves appearing at the same time. What's the deepest stage of sleep? Slow wave sleep. That's when these areas are most turned off physiologically by sleep. So the clinical correlation is the point in time where his eyes fix in the midline, when the slow waves appear, that's when the drug has had this effect at the brainstem. You can actually see it, right? And then the other part is he becomes atonic. Now, there, there are a number of reasons this could occur because propofol goes all up along the spinal cord. I'm just going to give you one, which is in the brainstem, which is probably maybe the least obvious. So in, this, in, the, in the same area here, you have these nuclei, the pontine reticular nuclei and the medullary reticular nuclei. And what they are, they're relays. They're relays to the anti-gravity muscles. Okay? They're the, like the cheerleaders, you know, kind of do that thing. You know which I can't do, but you know what I mean, sort of thing. So you need those muscles to basically do that. These major relay nuclei actually go to them. And, you know, the neurologist will tell you that if you have a patient who comes in and they have a pontine stroke, so they get a stroke in this area of the brain here, let's say because they get a clot here in the Bowser artery, when they present, they don't present with a spastic paralysis, they actually present with a flaccid paralysis. And so one, one of the ways that you're actually inducing that here is just by taking out these nuclei, these relay nuclei, all right? Because the motor pathways, when they come through the brainstem, actually run sort of like right along here. 
So the point is we can make a lot of very robust inferences about how the drugs are working if we just put our clinical insights you know, together with a little bit of anatomy. Now let me just show you these stages of the EEG. So that's someone awake. There's that sedative state that I showed you, that beta oscillation. So if you, so if you watch this, if you were to watch the EEG, you, know, you give your patients a little bit of midazolam just before you start the case, and you take them in the room and you put the EEG on, that's exactly what you would see. You'd see this 12, this 12 to 16 hertz oscillation like that, precisely, precisely the same way. And then here is what this guy went to. He went from here to here and then right down to here into those slow oscillations. But this is the state I'm going to talk about most, which is the one where we typically hold patients when we have them unconscious under anesthesia. I showed you the birth suppression, and then in between the suppression periods, you basically have the isoelectric state. Now, I'm not going to talk about paradoxal excitation. We can come back to that, you know, sort of later. But these are the various states. And I just want to make two main points here. Look how big this is. Look, so this is five microvolts, okay? When you get down to deeper states of anesthesia, like in here where we keep people for the purpose of surgery, look how big the oscillations get. So if this is like five, this is 20 or 50 microvolts, or sometimes in kid as, kids as large as 1,000 microvolts. So for something like that to happen, you have to get large numbers of circuits in the brain doing essentially exactly the same thing. All right, so what's happening in the, in the brain is not subtle. And in particular, it's these oscillations that are most likely causal of the altered arousal states that you see under anesthesia. Now, I'm going to show these in terms of spectra. And so just to go through this, these are the same sort of data. So this is time on this axis here. This is frequency. Okay? And what I'm showing here is color-coded a woman who had an induction here. She's 19 years old. She had an induction. She got propofol. And then we maintain her on our propofol infusion. And then basically, this, this, uh, this slow oscillation and 10 hertz oscillation are both showing up right here. There's the slow, the low frequency oscillation there. There's the 10 hertz oscillation. And as long as you keep the propofol running, it stays there. When you turn it off, it disappears. So this is that slow oscillation back over here. And this is the combination of the two, which is taken from this minute 24. So you have these two conditions. This is, a, this, is a ver this is typical propofol. And this case here is interesting because it's the same thing. This was a lady who's 52 years old, and the surgeons wanted to do an examination under anesthesia. So we gave her like about a 50 milligram bolus of propofol, and he says, I can't do my exam, so I give her another 50. And literally as soon as I give it, he says, I'm done. Okay. I guess that's never happened to you, but, 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 but what I want to show you is I gave her no more anesthesia. That's the key point. She goes through, there's the slow oscillation state. She goes into birth suppression. This is what birth suppression looks like. She went into this state. She stayed in that for eight minutes. She's getting no more anesthesia. Then she breaks into the 10 hertz oscillation, and she finally wakes up over here, which is about 25 or 30 minutes after, the original, after she actually got the drug. So the drug, the brain went through these dynamic states. All right? This is what's always happening when we, when we take care of our patients. So these are the guys that I've been working with to do this. So Patrick Purden, my longstanding colleague, Nancy, Nancy Coppell, who's a mathematician at Boston University, Shenong Cheng, who's one of my postdocs, who's now on the faculty at Wash U, my neurosurgery colleague, Ahmad Eskandar, Eric Pierce, my anesthesiology colleague, Laura, Laura Lewis, who's one of my PhD students, who's now a junior junior fellow at Harvard, and Sid Cash, who's one of my neurology colleagues. So I want to show you one, one last little bit of phenomenology, then we'll do a little bit of mechanism. So John Tinker and Mitchenfelder figured out this thing many years ago called anteriorization. And it's the idea that when you become unconscious under anesthesia, there's a movement of the waveforms from the back of the head to the front. It concentrates in the front, and then it moves back when you recover consciousness. And so we looked at this in patients and volunteers in whom we gave increasing doses, systematically increasing doses of propofol and systematically decreasing doses of propofol. And this is us just measuring the EEG at like 44 sites across the brain. There's 64 in all, but I'm just showing 44 of them here. And there's one other little factoid which I'll tell you about. If you stand here like this and you just close your eyes and you put EEG electrodes in the back of your head, 
you will get a 10 hertz oscillation like this, very, very regular. Maybe about 5 to 10 percent of people don't have it. We might tend to lose it a little bit as we get older. But it's very, very robust. And that's what we're doing here. So we have this guy lying there on his back with his eyes closed. And if you count 0, 10, 20, 30, 0, 10, 20, 30, he has this alpha oscillation, which you can see in the back of his head. Now I'm going to play the video. And you're going to see that here's the drug level. And you're going to see, you'll see exactly when You'll see exactly when he starts to, this was going to move from here to the front. It's going to concentrate in the front. It's going to disappear in the back. And then when we give the, when we turn the infusion off, it's going to move backwards. So here, I'll just play it for you. So there's the baseline. So no drug is infusing. Now the infu and each level is about 14 minutes. So this level one lasts 14 minutes. See it breaking down here? It's appearing in the front. There's level two. Level three. See, now you see the pattern here entirely in the front. And there you are at level five here. So I'm just going to stop it here for a second. So you see, so look, so this is the top of the head right here. And look from here forward. See how you have the same pattern across the front of the head there. From here back, it's entirely different. And you see that that alpha oscillation is totally gone now here. It just has slow oscillations everywhere. Now, if you let this go ahead, now watch what happens. It moves backwards. Look how, look how abruptly that disappeared. And then the, slow, the 10 hertz oscillation reappears here. Okay? So that's, it takes two hours to go up and come completely down. All right, so what's happening here? So propofol acts on GABAergic interneurons. They're everywhere, the thalamus, the cortex, and in the brain stem. So see, there's that pathway I was talking about coming from the preoptic area. It comes out, you have the inhibition set up there, and it just blocks them. So this is what we see. So how does this relate to that? All right. So here's the relationship. Let's talk about the 10 hertz oscillation first. So what we think is happening there, one of the key things is this, that pattern I showed you, this 10 hertz oscillation concentrating on the front of the head there. When you look at its structure, it's highly coherent. In other words, the 10 hertz oscillations everywhere on the front of the head are moving together in unison. All right? So what could actually do that? So what we figured out, thanks to some modeling work with Nancy Coppell, was that it's most likely an oscillation going back between the thalamus and the cortex. All right? So why would that make you unconscious? So here's an analogy. Like, I'm talking to you now. You can hear my voice. You could compute a spectrogram of my voice. It would be over a broader frequency range. But you could see the spectral pieces. They'd be have high frequencies, they'd have low frequencies, they'd have big amplitudes, some would have small amplitudes. So if you said to me, I want you to give the same lecture, but you get one frequency, all right, and now you have to keep the amplitude uh, constant, then what I'm saying to you now would become wah, or if you give me a band, it'd be wah, 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 wah. So that's what, like what this is, right? So if you think of this as like communication, which is very broadband, and you shrunk it down to just a single frequency, it's going to be very, very hard to be conscious. That's the first thing. The second thing is that see how this oscillation is just as strong in amplitude and maybe as big? It has an entirely different structure. And this is one of the things that we figured out from our human studies. So, so excuse me, our human intracranial studies. So these are data which come from patients that have electrodes implanted for epilepsy surgery. They get the electrodes implanted. They stay in the hospital. They seize sufficiently so the neurologists and neurosurgeons can figure out where the seizure foci are. Then they come back and have the electrodes removed. When they come back, you have a human that has electrodes in the brain so you can see what the neurons are doing in the human brain. So if you look here, these are three recording sites on the cortex. So the red corresponds to there. The green is that one. And the blue is that one. So look at these two guys here that are close together. They're close together and they're in sync. They're like this. The red, and the, the red and the green are like this. This guy here is a little bit further away. And if you look, what happens is he's out of sync. The key part, though, is you see, the, see these little histograms here? The histograms are where the neurons are spiking. Okay? So once these slow oscillations appearing, appear, the neurons in the cortex can only spike in a limited times. So that means if we need neurons to communicate, 
So if I'm here and the place and, a, and another site is near me, I can communicate in a very narrow window with this area, but it's going to be very hard for me to communicate with an area over here. The point is that this sort of represents sort of a fragmentation of the cortex, right? So we think that this is, we don't quite understand why it's there. It most likely represents these up-down states that the cortex is known to be in when you have massive inhibition in place. But there's a practical implication for this. You know just as well as I do that the one thing that gets the attention of the press about anesthesia is awareness. People say, oh, after 170 years, you guys still can't figure out whether someone's unconscious or not, right? You know? And then, so if someone came to me and said, Emory, you know, the last time I had anesthesia, I was aware. I, they were operating on me and I was, I knew everything was going on and nobody realized. I said, that's not going to happen this time. I mean, practically speaking, I would dial you down until you had propofol and I saw this pattern and I saw this pattern and there's no way in the world that this neurocircuitry or this neurophysiology that I've stated here, here and here is correct, you're going to be conscious. So that's like the practical implication of it. So this is what I just told you. Those are the alpha oscillations. Those are the slow oscillations. I showed you the anteriorization. And I showed you that we could figure out a lot about the brainstem effects of the anesthetic just from, look, just from reasoning through a bit of the anatomy. So I just want to make an additional point. That's propofol. That's the pattern. When you change the drug, you change the receptor where it binds, you change the circuits where they act, you change the signature. Okay? That's dexmedetomidine. Here's ketamine. Different set of circuits where it's acting, a different EEG signature. So each drug has a very robust EEG signature that you can see quite well. And then just to add to this, this is sevoflurane. So sevoflurane is gabinergic, just like propofol. However, there's something addition about it we quant don't quite understand. It has an additional oscillation in here, which is this theta oscillation. And so the things that I've been talking about here, um, if you want to try this out, you can sort of teach yourself or play around with the EEG. There's a little educational module, which is at these, uh, both of these websites. It's not like the questions here are easier than the questions there. It's not like a Sudoku, you know, there's the easy Sudoku, and then there's the hard <laughs> Sudoku, it's not that. It's just that we took the same thing, so in case you didn't remember it, it's EEG anesthesia or anesthesia EEG, they get you the same exam. Just, just, it's free CME, actually. You can just try this out. And then this will appear, you know, this is in, uh, what I'm basically saying today in, the, in this first part of the lecture is actually in this review article, which is appearing next month in anesthesiology. All right, so how does this change with age? So here's, you've seen this now. 10, 10 hertz oscillation, slow oscillation, a guy who's, let's say, 30 years old. All right, now, so this guy here is about 57. He could be his dad. He's got the 10 hertz oscillation. Maybe it's a little bit weaker. The slow oscillation seems about the same, but you can see it quite well. Here's a lady who's 81 years old, right? You can see the 10 hertz oscillation. It's much fainter. Everybody's on the same scale. And there's a slow oscillation. You see her slow oscillation is much, is much weaker, right? And the other thing I just want to point out, look at this. You see how this is all blue here, right? So there's basically no oscillations above about 10 hertz in her EEG at all. And in fact, what that really means is, see these things are on the, these are on the decibel scale. So the drop from here to here is actually 25 decibels. So that's actually, the amplitude, the relative amplitude is quite, quite small relative to what the background is. Here's the part that's sobering, though. These two guys are the same age. His EEG looks like hers. His looks like his. So when you first see this, you go, wow, you know, something's up here. But you know, we age different physically. Our brains probably age differently, too. But what's kind of wild about it is you can maybe see it under anesthesia, right? And so you know, it, it, it's very, very interesting. And then if you look at this, the kids are on the other end of the spectrum. So there's the three-year-old, there's the 14-year-old. So there's this continuum. So again, a practical implication of this, if you built indices to track people under anesthesia, where you took people who are sort of mostly in this category here, and you took a measure, let's say, that took something from here and measured its ratio, let's say, to something here. Well, for this guy and this guy here, you're going to get about the same answer. When you take that same measure over here in the kids, right, the kids have a lot of power there. So that number is going to tell you the kid is wide awake when he's quite well anesthetized, when actually if you look at the pattern, you can see it's exactly the same pattern. He's certainly well anesthetized, okay? 
So this is why the indices don't work in the kids. And this is give you some sense of this very strong power that the kids have up here that's quite different from the, old, from the adults. Now I wanted to show you another practical implication of this. So this is the lady I was taking care of. She's 68 years old. She's on 1.3% sevoflurane for a mastectomy. And you can actually see the settings here. I, I, I took these photos uh, just directly from our monitors. So there's the, there's the sevo, sevo and oxygen, about 0.7 max. She's 68, right? Clinically, railroad track anesthesia, right? 52, heart rate, blood pressure 128 over by 85, SATs 99, temps 35.5. You can see a nice robust pulse ox trace, all right? This is her EEG, okay? So if you look right here, see how she has suppression, then burst, and then suppression. You can see it better here. So suppression, then burst, then suppression. She's in burst suppression. She's very, very deep, okay? And in fact, this is taken at 948, so that's right there. And you see the little indicator here. This indicator on the monitor tells you that you're in burst suppression. And it goes back in time. And so as long as it's blue, it says how long you've been in burst suppression. So she's been in burst suppression for 48 minutes, almost an hour. Okay? She's been there much deeper than she needs to be to be unconscious for the surgery. Right? When you go back and look at this, though, it's textbook anesthesia. Right? But we're using the heart rate and blood pressure to actually monitor brain function. And if we looked at brain function directly, we would see that this lady is far more anesthetized than she needs to be for this particular procedure. And I can tell you, because this lady here, going back to her, this is a case that I did. She, this, she's 81 years old. She had this football-sized mass on her chest. And uh, so it, it took the thoracic surgeons the better part of the day, almost seven hours or so, to basically get it off. This is time in minutes. And we ran her on an epidural and propofol infusion. And the propofol infusion was at like 40 to 50 mics per kilo per minute. I mean, what even, you might even think it's not even a sedative dose in some people, right? But she was completely anesthetized because she had the alpha oscillations and the slow oscillations. They're very weak. But the one thing you can do is you can change the scale on the monitor and actually see them better. So I knew she was well anesthetized. I wasn't afraid that I was underdosing her because I'm using the EEG to help me guide my anesthetic. And then at the end of the case, we were able to wake her up on a dime. So it was it, in contrast to this case here where someone is, uh, I, if I had done that with this lady here, I probably would have been there for an extra hour. And you've seen it. I'm sure you've, you've had these propofol cases where it takes the person a good amount of time to come to. It happens, all right? And this is probably why. All right, so this is what I've just said. Hemodynamics is stable, but in burst suppression for almost 50 minutes. So I just want to show you one other little practical thing. So I had the guy track my finger as he lost consciousness. So I do a neuro exam, a, a quick brainstem exam on all my patients on induction and recovery. And I do it because I just want to understand. I want to, I want to have a clinical sense of how people are losing consciousness. And I also want to do it because of the time when I really need to do it because there's a question about maybe an event having occurred. I want to have collected enough kind of clinical insight to know what's normal and what's pathologic. So with the help of well, who is now a medical student. Edith is at uh, Rutgers and Katie is at, uh, well now Katie's a resident at Cornell. My colleague Nico Schiff at Cornell and also Paul Garcia from uh, Emory. Um, we actually put together this little thing on uh, looking at the neuro exam for anesthesiologists. So here are those arousal centers again. And here are these various centers, respiration and muscle tone, the corneal reflex, the pharyngeal reflexes, the oculocephalic reflex, all right? So remember I had the guy track my finger, and then at the end of it, I turned his head to check the oculocephalic reflex. So look, when I'm checking the oculocephalic reflex, just to remind you, you're checking cranial nerves three, three, uh, four, and six. So this is in the midbrain here, and this is sitting right in the pons here. So the upper part, the midbrain and the upper part of the pons, right? Now, it's not so much that I care about the nuclei there, I'm making an inference. The inference is if these guys are affected, right, then these guys are probably affected too. The arousal centers are affected, and that's what you saw. When he could no longer move his eyes, he lost consciousness, okay? So one of the things that I do on, on induction, I mean, I do it on induction just to see when people lose consciousness. I, I actually just, 
I, I check the oxyphalic reflex after they stop responding. Or I have them count backwards. I have them count backwards and they go to about somewhere between 80, 85 or so at best. Most people between about 85 and 90. And then the same thing here with the, uh, you know, we, we flick the lash, right? And why do we flick the lash? Did you learn about the lash <laughs> reflex in medical school? I didn't. I learned about the corneal reflex, right? So what I do is I take just a little drop of salt, a little drop of stale, sterile water and just drop it on the, on the cornea. Just check the corneal reflex, right? That's what you're really trying to test. It's very, very simple to do. And, and you can basically see when these nuclei go out. And the way, the way I think about it is, when you watch someone recover from anesthesia, the breathing comes back first. You might see someone tearing and gagging. And so tearing would be seven and nine in here. Gagging is like 11 and 10. And so there's kind of a movement sort of up the brainstem, roughly speaking, when we're recovering from anesthesia. And it's really interesting. You can watch the EEG, and the EEG will show an apparent awake pattern. And the patient isn't back yet. If you check the oculocephalic reflex, it's still out. And it suggests that the holdup is right here at the top of the brainstem. And this is just an empirical observation, something I've been, I, I can't give you, it's just the factoid for the moment. I emphasize the oid part of that, the factoid, you know, just something I've been noticing over the last several years of doing this. But just check it. You, it's, it's easy enough to verify. So here's the thing. On induction, kind of the time sequence until things are lost, about, you know, about 35 minutes or so, 35 seconds or so until you lose the corneal reflex, things sort of going out kind of in this sequence. And the one thing which I found out, because um, when I read the textbooks, it said that under drug overdoses, the pupillary light reflex was intact, and that was one of the ways neurologists used to sort of figure out drug overdose from like maybe a, 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 maybe a brainstem event. But what I found is it's variable. The pupillary light reflex under anesthesia is quite variable. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it isn't. And it tends to relate to the size of the pupils. And the same thing here. On return, you know, people tended to start breathing first, kind of coughing and gagging, grimacing, the corneal reflex, verbal cues, and this is the interesting part here, the oculocephalic reflex. So you can extubate like right in here. Once someone's, you know, you feel like their airway's intact and all this sort of thing and you can take the tube out, right? But now if you go after that and check the corneal reflex, you'll see that their brain stem is not quite back all the way. And we're looking for reasons to understand why people may have delirium or and there's still residual anesthetic effect, which you can just check with your clinical exam. And I think it's important to know because then you have a much more nuanced idea of how sedated or how awake is when you send someone to the recovery room. All right? So just a, a, a little bit of practical anesthesia. And so this is just a little look into the future. So we anesthetize patients. And so one thing that Ken Salt has been studying is ways of bringing, bringing, uh, bringing you back from anesthesia. So Ken has this laboratory. And uh, so he has these rat volunteers which come in and, and he anesthetizes them. And so here's one of them. So this guy is anesthetized with isoflurane and he's got an IV in his tail vein there. And, uh, he's, and there's isoflurane in the chamber. He's been there for like 20 minutes or so. And so what Ken is gonna do is just inject some Ritalin here. So he injects the Ritalin and now he's gonna flush it through. And the rat comes to, I mean, or it changes. Let's just say there was a change. You don't want to get excited. There's a change. All right. So the rat cha changes state here. Okay. Now he's got a turnover for this to count. Right. Come on, guy, you can do it. <laughs> He, he does make it. I've seen the end of the video. <laughs> so, so, so he, he, all right. Uh, boom. Okay, he made it. All right, good, good. It took him about, yeah, you know, what, 47 seconds or something, all right? So, but remember, the anesthesia is still there. So what is Ken doing? Ken is giving Ritalin. And what Ritalin does, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. So he's actually, it's like giving an injection of dopamine you know, into the brain here. And in fact, he's done this by actually stimulating electrically here in the ventral tegmental area, 
which is this very, very important pathway for cognition, so mesocortical pathway. But, but let me just give you some, a different bit of intuition about this, because the better intuition of this actually comes from the information on the street. We were talking about this earlier today. You know, there are a lot of people who are in high-stress jobs who treat themselves with stimulants. In fact, there's an article in the April 18th issue of the New York Times where they talk about people taking ADH drugs to help maintain performance. And this, this starts off with a little scenario of this woman who's trying to run her startup company. Her investors want to see, like, they got this email late at night. She has to rework all the numbers to, to show, show to the investors the next morning. So she calls up her supplier, and he provides her with Adderall. So she pops Adderall, and then within a few seconds of taking it, her brain feels sharp, and she works all night, you know, gets this done, then sleeps for an hour and a half and runs off to the office at 9 o'clock, all right? So this is kind of the same thing, right? So you've had the brain under anesthesia, and it's sitting there oscillating like this. You turn it off, and it's still, there's still some residual oscillation, I can tell you that. But we know that there's cognitive dysfunction. So why not activate a pathway that is associated with sharpening cognition? I mean, that's basically what this word on the street is essentially telling you. And so you could give Ritalin and essentially do that. And we actually have good ideas that this is dopamine because Ken is actually stimulated here directly electrically and also optogenetically. So one of the things that we would propose is you would give your patients Ritalin or something like that to bring them out of anesthesia and maybe help diminish this, this cognitive dysfunction and also help their brains be, be sharper afterwards. So this is what I've just told you. So I've given you some sense of using the EEG, understanding neural circuits, the neurophysiology, and what ways we can actually use it in the operating room. I think that this is going to be critical for us. We should put more emphasis on neuroanatomy, neurophysiology. But not only just neurophysiology, but just the basic clinical neuro exam. We should use the EEG, the way we use the electrocardiogram for the heart. This is the brain's electrocardiogram, if you would. And we should get away from thinking about drug effects in the lungs and blood and being able to look at the CNS effects essentially in real time. And I'll just leave you with this idea here. I mean, this is sort of the way I view what we do as anesthesiologists. See, the rest of the world revolves around us. You know, we're, we're like here and, you know, there's the rest of the world revolving around us. We're great, you know, sort of thing. But it's really cool when you think about it. What we do relates to all of these states. I mean, just pick any one of them. Ketamine can simulate schizophrenia. Now you can use it to treat depression. It's actually used as a major pain medication. You give low-dose methohexital, you can make patients seize. You give high-dose methohexital, you can treat a seizure. Right? And, or you look over here, we were just talking a second ago, drug addiction, one of the biggest things in drug addiction are, the, are drugs in the categories that we most frequently use. And the whole idea of using a dopaminergic agent to try to bring someone out of anesthesia, we borrowed from the actual uh, ICU literature or the neuro ICU literature where they often put patients on amantadine, which is a dopaminergic agonist, to try to activate whatever brain circuits they could possibly use. Actually, but the better story is what happens on the street because it works, right? These people actually use this thing on a day-to-day -day basis. Why wouldn't it work, you know, to bring someone out of anesthesia? And just one other thing, you know, there are those of us who are old enough to remember when you used to give droperidol together with fentanyl and it used to cause a locked-in state, right? I mean, you look at the patient and they look like everything's perfectly fine. They come to him and goes, that was the worst experience of my life, right? They're physiologically stable and what have you, but we can actually create locked-in states chemically. So the insights that what we do can provide into the brain will certainly help us as far as anesthesiology is concerned, but I think can also make very, very robust contributions to other fields of, of clinical neuroscience. And I think that's why, among other things, it's one of the reasons we should take what we do a lot more seriously. So thank you. So my, my, my personal opinion is I think it should be. I mean, I, I think because, put it this way, since, 20, um, since the fall of 2011, I haven't done a single case without using the EEG unless it's like a craniotomy or something like that. I, I use it on all my patients. 
I mean, I, the, I, I learn something every day, something, something quite different every day. So I think it should be. How many, how many do you use and how do you set that up in a way that's practical? practical? So, um, so there's, these are four leads of EEG. So, so the first thing is, all these things that I showed you, like from the patient in the operating room, that's not like a special research montage or anything. That's just a standard monitor. And it has six leads, so two here, two here, and two in the middle. So the two recording electrodes out here, the reference in the ground in the middle, and just the sticker just slaps on the forehead, basically like that. So that's, that's essentially what we're looking at. Um, even when patients are prone, right, as long as you just put some padding under this, you know, the sticker works, works perfectly fine. It's a little bit tricky with kids as they get younger and younger because their skin gets to be, you know, sort of brittle and very, very thin. But we've, we've, we've gotten data on even three-month-olds, you know, with these, Z zero to three-month-olds with this. Question? How does this work? Um, uh, there's some talk about immobilization uh, uh, receptors that are involved in general anesthesia. Some of the other, uh, besides propofol, have been involved in in immobilization. There's also drugs that only cause immobilization but don't affect your cognition or your memory. Um, and and all this basically, how does it how does it affect into the memory? Because a lot of times our memory is associated with nicotinic uh, cholinergic receptors, and you're not really you know directly dealing with this. I didn't see any. I'm sorry, I didn't see any what? I didn't see any reference to, to, their, to, to the fall pairing my response to, uh, <laughs> to the um, uh, nicotinic cholinergic receptors forming long-term memory, which is what we're really kind of worried about. Okay, so so let me just take the memory question first. So, propofol doesn't know anything about nicotinic receptors. It knows about GABAergic receptors. Right. It goes in and finds those, and it generates this pattern over here right there. And I can tell you when you're profoundly unconscious like this, and the other thing too is if you look at the hippocampus, mm -hmm. so there's a, there's a reason a lot of seizures start in the medial temporal lobe. It's because if you look at the, the density of inhibitory interneurons in there, it's actually very, very large. So when those guys aren't working, it's not surprised that you end up with like seizure states. Right? And then one of the things that happens is, so there's this oscillation. This is what you can see in the cortex. And I just happen to know, because we have, we've done recordings in the hippocampus, so which is important for forming memories, right? So sort of a, a initial formation of memories, it's oscillating just like this. So I can tell you that when you're unconscious like this, there's no way in the world you're going to remember. See, what happens is, see, the, the, the thing is, I want someone to show me, right? See, the proof should go the other way. People that have these cases of awareness, they have not been monitoring the EEG. And this is just an empirical statement, backed up with a bit of physiology. I'm willing to conjecture that they were probably up there like these beta states. And it's very easy to be there. And like when that, if you, like that beta state that I showed you before, right? When someone's in those states, they're arousable. They can be, they can remember. You haven't really turned the system off. This is profoundly turning the system off. So I don't think you have to invoke anything about nicotinic receptors or whatever. It's just understanding what the physiology, what the drug is doing, and, and realize that if, you, if you're being made unconscious like this, you can't remember. So, so, just, so, so Leon works on seizures, right? So what happens with a seizure? You get highly regular oscillations, just like this. And what does a person do? they become unconscious. And so this is just realizing that we are clinically doing the same thing. We're generating oscillations like that. And as long as you keep the drug on, that's what the brain is doing. Question? Yeah, so, so in other words, when I'm, on it, when I'm giving someone dexmedetomidine, like I'm not looking for this, right? I'm looking for this. And, th and, I, and actually, this right here, this is actually deep dexmedetomidine. Now, this is someone who's profoundly sedated on dexmedetomidine, but they're still arousable. When someone who's lightly sedated on dexmedetomidine, there's a different pattern. There's actually a, um, there's a little. Do you choose that for one patient over another patient? Yeah, depending on what I want to, depending upon what I want to achieve. Or to say it another way, when I use dex, when I've decided to use dex, 
I look for the dynamics in here. And then the other thing that I happen to know is that, remember how here, see these slow oscillations here? See they're discoordinated across the cortex? Dex is different, they're like this. They're actually coordinated. And that makes sense, right? Because under Dex, you're arousable and you can become responsive. I mean, there, there's a point where you can make someone really profoundly, but that's not usually in the range we use it. So there's the, the slow oscillation under DEX are actually different from the slow oscillations under propofol. So I, so I definitely use that. Question? I thought it was interesting that each individual have a, almost a signature pattern in this dynamic response to this process. Mm -hmm. And I think earlier you also alluded to the, the, the response changes over someone's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. It changes very dramatically. Do you have a sense of what are the patterns that's, um, has a, uh, have related to the temporal changes of one's, uh, you know, the lifetime? And what are the patterns in uh, more like individuality? Right. Uh, so dif different among different individuals. Right. So um, we're just getting this sorted out, but we, we've seen a lot of data on it now. So we've done a lot of data in kids now, thanks to the help of our, our colleagues at Children's Hospital in Boston. And this dynamic is pretty robust across the age spectrum, right? And so what you're seeing here are two things, two physiological things. This is brain development, and this is probably brain degeneration, okay? So brain development, so what happens? So a couple things happen. You have neurons which have to come up from the thalamus and actually hook into the cortex and eventually form connections. So that if I showed you someone, if I showed you a kid here who was between zero to three months of age, all you would see would just be slow oscillations. Once they get to four months of age, then you start to see alpha and, and uh, slow oscillations together. However, it doesn't move. It's in the front and the back. It doesn't move until you're about 12 to 14 months of age. Then, from there on, the power just increases, increases, increases until it reaches about a maximum, somewhere between six to eight, eight, eight years of age. Then empirically, we see it actually goes down. So what's happening in the brain during that time? That's the same period where you have all this extension, so the, you go out and you make all these connections which are primarily excitatory, then you have pruning and you move towards inhibition. Right? And then over time, you know, you settle into patterns that are basically stable. Now the brain starts to get older and it degenerates. And degeneration, doesn't even have, you don't have to talk about Alzheimer's or plaques or anything like that. Just take a neuron, right? All right? The myelin sheath starts to break down. It loses volume. It becomes more susceptible to oxidative stress. You don't make as much neurotransmitter. The dendrites aren't as dynamic. So this is just an older machine trying to do the same thing, basically. And then what happens is, is that now you're saying, if you're a kid, you can oscillate like this when you get older. And by the time you're in your 80s, you're oscillating like this. So, so to answer your question, we think that this pattern is actually fairly robust. Now what's interesting is that this happens in different people in different times. But, but this is about right. And these are the, the middle-aged people can either look like this or they can look like that. And that's one of the things which is actually very, very sort of sobering. Question? Yes. So the, the change you see as you move from posterior to a more rostral type picture is a reflection of both your awakes, uh, your level of arousal and the drug concentration has increased. But uh, you said it's sort of along the occipital, if you do like an occipital EEG, that pattern is normal, that narrow band of communication that you see is, is normal back there in a wake patient. Right. Do you have any idea of what oh, that wake is? Oh, wake eyes closed. Wake eyes closed. Is there right. any indication of what that narrow pattern occipital EEG has on the state of arousal? What the meaning of that narrow band? So, so basically, so, so that pattern actually suggests that, that pattern, which, which was here on the EEG, this, this thing here, this, 
So this year, right? So um, the jury is still out, to be honest with you, as to why this occurs, all right? And there's some statements that it has to do with the brain going into sort of like a holding pattern. I'm really I'm hand waving now, totally hand waving. That it goes into like a holding pattern when you take away sensory inputs, visual sensory inputs. And so the vi so you're closing your eyes, and so like this area just goes into these states. That that's sort of like what we know about it. Um, what's helpful for us is because you can create the state with eyes closed, right? See, if I had your eyes open, you wouldn't see anything there. The guy kept his eyes open. And plus, the blink artifacts actually mess up the EEG quite a bit. But with your eyes closed, now you can actually see this dynamic in a very, very clean way. And what's interesting, you come back to it. So I, I, I don't quite understand all the implications for it for like the awake EEG. She had a question here for a while. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and ask about the methylphenidate experience. Oh, sure. Uh -huh. um, very interesting. I was wondering, though, if you had considered what or how emergence would be affected in a population that takes methylphenidate chronically, mm -hmm. um, especially since we're dealing with an amphetamine derivative and tolerance develops, things like so that. So I can tell you, people who are on methylphenidate are hard to anesthetize. I, I, I've seen it. And in fact, you know, in kids who take Ritalin, who've taken their methylphenidate on the morning of surgery, it sometimes, free, if the an pediatric anesthesiologist doesn't know it, it freaks them out because they're amazed by how much they have to go up on the drug to get the kid anesthetized. And so, like, we had it happen. We had this psychiatrist we were taking care of, and we were, like, amazed. Like, dude, I mean, like, two sticks of, penithol, two sticks of propofol to, like, anesthetize him? And the sevoflurane was up at three and a half percent the whole time. And as soon as we turned it off, it was like, whoo! I mean, he literally jumped up, like, I'm not exaggerating, like this. And he goes, you know, we, you know, we were, you know, we were amazed that, you know, it took so much anesthesia to keep you so anesthetized. And so we were talking to him, and he says, well, you know, I've been self-medicating with real one. <laughs> so, so, like, thank you, you know? Good of you to tell us, you know? So, very, very real. Question? So for the moment, all I can say is it's just, I'm, just, I'm just reporting phenomenology that I see, okay? That in, particularly in this middle age range here, you can see this degree, you can see some variability which is very, very real, right? Now, um, whether or not it has clinical importance, I think the jury's out. And we know we'll have to start looking at this in relationship to exactly the sorts of things that you're, you're mentioning. However, I've seen a few things. These are just anecdotes. I had a gentleman who was 77, and when I anesthetized, he was a financial analyst, he retired, finan 73, financial analyst, retired. Put the EEG on him, running propofol, looked like this, right? However, by the end of the case, which wasn't that long, it was about an hour and a half, it looked like this. It had sort of run down a little bit. It was like you were saying that when you were finishing anesthetic, identify the point in time where they don't respond to the man. Mm -hmm. And that's where you cut off. If you think that somebody who's going to be 57 that maybe this person can understand, uh, read at college level textbooks, and maybe that person is at the grade level, they're both able to function in society. But, right. Uh, but on the other hand, if, if let's say <coughs> this person had, uh, if they already had comparable uh, you know, spectrograms, could it be that this person is a chronic alcoholic or could be. had a chronic brain injury or TBI? It, it could be. So I'll tell you two factoids on that. I, I, so first of all, I took care of a gentleman who was a drug abuser. And he had been shooting up and got, you know, classic case, necrotizing infection, had to be, was in the ICU, returned to the operating room multiple times to have back dressing changes. 
So I went up to get him, and I asked the nurses, you know, how sedated he is. She goes, yeah, he's not all that responsive. We're not having to give him that much. So I said, have you looked at his EEG? He said, well, no, we don't have the EEG up here in the ICU. So I brought him down to the operating room, and uh, he's 34, so he should look like this. Okay, 34. And I thought the EEG wasn't working. It was blue, but it was blue from here all the way down to here, right? And then what I've come to realize after doing this with a lot of patients coming from the ICU, there's this phenomenon which I'll call for the moment sick brain syndrome. These people who have these massive, probably inflammatory lo loads, it shows up in the EEG as like a brain which is just like totally, totally turned off. And it makes sense because look at them. They're often just so somnolent in the, in, the, in, the, in the ICU. And the point is if you put the EEG on, you can see it which is the reason they didn't have to give him much, much anesthesia. So there it was very, very clear. And then in, uh, in, in another case I was taking care of, I was talking with a guy before, before in a preoperatively. And he's 33, and something didn't quite seem right. I couldn't put my finger on it. And uh, when I looked at his, just before we were about to go in the operating room, he says, oh, you know, I was a rugby player. And I said, oh, okay. And so then uh, when we put on the EEG, he looked like this. He should have looked like that. So there, there may be some correlation, but we'll have to kind of like, like, like sort it out. But I think it's important to know because if I'm recommending that people use you know, the EEG to track brain states of patients under anesthesia, we have to get a real sense of what's the physiological variability and what part of that physiological variability may relate also to potential damage brain states, or as you're suggesting, be predictive. Is that any, like, recently they just did brain biopsies on the football players, and they came out and said it's a problem with the bathrooms on the office, and as this technology is easier than cheaper, you can use it there, use it in the workplace, in a variety of environments. So let me say it this way. If we had been monitoring the anesthesia, if we had been monitoring the brain for the last 20 years, we would know that. We'd know it now. And so, and my point is, if we start doing this, like in five years or three, three years, we could know that. And we could have a much more nuanced way of taking care of these patients. But what's sort of wild is, I mean, I feel like I've gotten to look inside someone's bedroom, right? I mean, like, dude, you know, your brain, whoa, dude. You, 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 you haven't been good to yourself. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, you know. I'm not supposed to know this, right? You know, only your anesthesiologist knows, right? You know, like, whoa, man, you know, you better lighten it up a little bit, you know, you know. Question. Going back to um, the theories of, of, you know, general anesthesia, we often have the, uh, uh, where we can add something onto it. You've got a pure drug here, you know, and you've got a pure effect on the drug. But we know that with anesthesia, if you add a opioid, which is basically going to go on a mu receptor, we can decrease the, the MAC, uh, the movement. We can decrease the MAC uh, bar. We can, you know, and we can even, if we have the, you know, craziness, we can decrease their MAC awake level, mm -hmm. you know. And basically, uh, that's going on a totally, how is that affecting this? And, you know, there are, type, like uh, uh, Lou uh, did cases where he did MAC bar and did Remy fentanyl, mm -hmm. you know, and then showed that, that there was a big decrease. Um, no, that's these. a fantastic question. Like, what happens with the mixtures, essentially? So, so the, it turns out that um, we've had to learn them. So, so the first point is, when you mix the drugs together, the effects that you see are the combined effects that you could predict from the single, from the action of the single drugs. So, specifically for Remy fentanyl, and the only reason I know this is that you know we had the propofol shortage, and as a consequence of the propofol shortage, we did a lot of Remy fentanyl inductions. And so Remy fentanyl by itself produces just very profound slow oscillations. So when you do like a propofol and Remy infusion, you can't tell the slow oscillations that come from propofol from the slow oscillations that come from Remy. And by the same token, if you did Remy with sevoflurane, the same thing would be the case because sevo produces a slow oscillation and the Remy slow oscillation would be masked by it. But however, if you started off with someone on, let's say like, you start off with someone, and so this I do all the time because I have, I work on the uh, gastric bypass cases. And so we run sevoflurane, then we'll start ketamine, okay? 
So this is Siebel fluorine. This is a pure Siebel fluorine trace. So this here, sorry, this here, there's ketamine. Okay? When you put them together, the Siebel fluorine starts off right here. And when you add the ketamine, you give the bolus and you start the infusion, you see this rise up. It doesn't rise up to 30, it rises up to 20. It rises up to a compromised frequency. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that, see, Siebel fluorine, like propofol, is working on those, those gabinergic interneurons. Mm -hmm. And then ketamine comes in and says, hey, guys, I'm going to tie them up. And it blocks the NMDA receptors on the inhibitory interneurons, and it takes them out. So propofol's ability to, or Siebel fluorine's ability to sort of maintain mm -hmm. that nice alpha oscillation mm -hmm. is basically compromised. And they actually fight for those interneurons. And you get a nice compromised pattern, which goes up to 20 hertz, not up to 30. And it's not at, out, not at 10, but it's at 20 now. So you can actually see that. And the same thing, you mix dex with ketamine. So the combinations make sense from a mechanistic standpoint. And they're what you'd predict just based on the actions of the single drug. Now, have I mastered all of them? No, I haven't. But, but, it's, but it, it, it's very, very tractable. Wait, one question back here. Uh, Sorry, there's some concern uh, about uh, long-term effects of anesthesia in children when they receive uh, many frequent anesthetic procedures mm -hmm. uh, in terms of learning, etc. Have you uh, observed any uh, changes in the EG patterns in response to propofol in children who had multiple anesthetic procedures early on? So, so, we, haven't, so we haven't done that study yet, but. Uh, so with the help of Chuck Birdie at Children's and also Patrick Purden, I mentioned before, is at Mass General, they're going to start looking at that. And, th and again, there's a very natural set of experiments that they're going to look at, na natural set of procedures. Kids who come for repeated proton beam therapy, they get sometimes 30 to 40, do 30 to 40 anesthetics in the course of a month. And so we're, they're actually going to look at it, you know, basically, you know, in those... Uh, in those kids. So I'll give you a person. So I'm on the whole Smart Tots committee. And this is a personal opinion. This isn't from Smart Tots. Let me think. Are anesthetics toxic? Are they natural? No, they're not natural. Are they toxic? Yeah, they're toxic. So we're, we're done. We've answered the question. So I, so I think what we should work on is alternatives, right? Because think about it. Suppose we spend all this money, and in five years or 10 years, we prove that they're toxic, and we have no alternatives. Where are we going to be? So I would just assume they're toxic. You know, again, toxic in quotation marks, right? You know, on a continuum, right? But then we should be working like crazy to come up with alternatives. And in fact, I'm amazed. The brain amazes me even more now, right? I keep you like this for two hours, three hours, four hours, and somehow after that, you come back and your brain functions normally. That is not natural. It is, n it's, it's, I, don't, I, won't, I won't say that. It's not natural, right? <laughs> right, right? I was about to say something, but you know, you can't say those things. Things you say to your kids and stuff. But, but anyway, so, so the brain is basically doing this for, for hour after hour. And then to say, okay, I'll turn it off and let's be friends again and you should work like you should and all this sort of thing. And it just doesn't happen, right? So the drugs are toxic. Again, this is Emory Brown speaking, not, not smart tots. The drugs are toxic and we should be working on alternatives. I think that's the real, that's the real answer. Leon? We have actually, we have, and it turns out. So one of the things that people had suggested is that a way you could track brain states under anesthesia would be to look at gamma oscillations and see when they disappear, because gamma represents cognitive activity, right? So they figured that the gamma oscillations would drop out as you become more unconscious. It actually turns out that. In, in, this, in this paper here, in this paper here, where we talk about the, uh, the alpha oscillations, we actually show that over time, the power in the gamma band actually goes up in the cognitive band. See, what changes, though, is the dynamics. They're all, they're all modulated by this basic, by this slow oscillation. So they don't go down, they actually go up. So, but the magnitude of them relative to these guys here is much smaller. So see, they're up here. But you can see they are something like, uh, like 15, like 30 dB smaller 
So they become quite inconsequential relative to the magnitude of these oscillations. So they, they don't really help us in sort of sorting out conscious versus unconsciousness. You, you a question back there. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, in your, and you touched on it a little bit with Alzheimer's. I, I'm sorry, I'm a little trouble hearing um, You touched on it a little bit with Alzheimer's and TBI that you get a decrease in the normal pattern um, as, as basically have brain function that worsens. What about people who have specific dopamine disorders of the brain, like Parkinson's or a history of drug abuse, who aren't super sick or end stage? Yeah. And that elective population, like they come in from gallbladders, and like, do you see that they fall still on that normal, somewhere on that spectrum, or do they exhibit a slightly different pattern? I mean, that's a very, very good question. And I, I can honestly, I haven't looked at enough to really be able to say. Like, you know, the epilep I haven't seen enough, like, epilepsy patients coming for, let's say, non-epilepsy-related surgeries, you know, to, to be able to say. But, but the good thing about this is it gives us a frame of reference on how to think about it. Because if they do have diminished function, it starts to maybe suggest, and, and the conjecture is that they probably would, right, given, you know, what their brains have, have been through. But at this time, I, I honestly don't know. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. So um, only if you promise you'll never flick the lash again, then I'll tell you. <laughs> n n never flick the lash again. All right, there's a that's forbidden. All right. So 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 you know so the you know the standard setup is you know the patient is lying like that, the head is here, the resident is here, and the monitors are over there, right? So if I can, I usually stand on the I'm standing on like the left side of the patient, all right? So what I ask the patient to do is I say, just count backwards out loud so I can hear you. All right, so they can start counting backwards. And then it's very interesting. Then you realize counting seems simple, but counting is actually complex. So you have to remember the last number you just said and then say the next one which comes after it. So people will eventually start going uh, 91, um, uh, 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 89, uh, and you know, they'll start to break up. So they break up somewhere between about 85 or so. All right. So as soon as they stop, what I do is, you know, the residents are slick now. So they've got their technique now. So they're getting the tape. They're about to tape that. I say, just give me a second before you put the tape on. Just give me one second here. And I just take the head and just turn it, right? And you'll see the eyes are fixed. It takes two seconds to do. Then I have a syringe of sterile water there. And I said, let's just check the corneals. Drop both eyes. Corneals are gone. Then, the re the, being on the left side is relevant because the anesthesia machine is right there. And if you look at the monitor, that's when the big slow waves come on, all right? So on return, you know, once everybody figures out that they've done it, you start, you, you know, you, you reverse the muscle relaxant and you're letting the patient come back. Then what I do is, um, the first thing I do is I, I, just, I, I just take the arm just to see what the muscle tone is like. The muscle tone is usually still not there. And let's say the person started breathing. So typically what we observe is they start coughing. So if they haven't started coughing, I want to still know how deep they are because the EEG will show an awake pattern already. The EEG's come back. The cortex says, guys, we're set. You know, we're good to go, all right? So I'll take like a suction catheter and just go down the endotracheal tube because that's the, like the most noxious, legitimate thing that you can do to somebody, right? So, so I do that. And if they respond to that and start coughing, then they come to. All right, they don't come to to that. Then what I do is I have this thing. It's a symmetric body pinch. So I start from here, right? And I just give them a pinch all the way up the body, you know, up and down for about 15 or 20 seconds, right? Because what that does is, see, that excites nociception at all levels of the spinal cord. And that's actually fairly noxious. And so then that usually, if that, that usually brings people, usually brings people back. And then they, they start to come too. So now I then check like the oculocephalic reflex, you know, check the corneals. And then I may end up checking it several times. And so the first time you might see them, no blink. Then just blink on one side, right? And not on the other. Then they blink like crazy, like, dude, why are you putting this sterile water in my eyes? You know, this is like annoying, right? But what's very interesting, the, the oculocephalic reflex may still not be back. And, and you'll get a sense of, because all I have to do is just turn the head very gently. Or at the end of the case, let me say it this way. What I found empirically is if you can get people to like move their eyes at the end of the case, kind of like I had the guy doing, if they can do that again, they're really back. 
because that means that you know, there's enough return of function around that sort of midbrain area that the arousal centers are probably back too. So that, that, that's, that's roughly how I do it. I can, the because of the chronic um, opioid users are hard to anesthetize, right? Yeah, the chronic stimulant users are, are, are clearly hard to anesthetize. I mean, the um, I mean I could I mean I haven't like thought about it in detail beyond just the sort of the, the, the conversations about it. But you know what essentially well so so just take a kid who gets Ritalin, right? A kid who gets Ritalin. What you're basically doing for that kid is essentially this. You can see it in this diagram here. He's running around with a higher level of dopamine in there. Excitatory neurotransmitter. So to anesthetize someone, there's always a balance between inhibition and excitation. Now, if you want to get the, in the inhibition to a state where someone can be operated on, you've got to overcome that. I mean, it's just like someone who comes in who's all hyped up, you know, you know, because they're, they're scared or afraid, and we see it all the time. Or the person who gets just a little bit of a day's lamp so they're now calm, the amount of propofol you need to give them to do the induction is, is often, you know, less. So I, think it's, I, think, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. And I, I think it really is this. That, that's what the Ritalin has been doing with these people. Yeah. So what do you think about this monitoring? Uh, can it be used as a substitute for EGs in the ORs? Uh, but the latest data, or the data for uh, this monitoring in cardiac surgical patients to detect cerebral hyperperfusion is still controversial. They say it doesn't really help. Uh, so what is your thought about it? So, you know, I, I, I don't have any real experience with BIS. We used to have BIS in our ORs up until about 2010. And I was always very frustrated with it because I couldn't see what I'm showing you here. I couldn't see the EEG. I certainly couldn't see like the, the, the spectrogram. And I guess intellectually it just bothers me that uh, we've been made to reduce our thinking about what's happening in the brain to an idea that came from engineers. And, and I'll just tell you a little bit of history about this. You may not be aware of this, right? The people who built this originally didn't really care about the brain. And I know this because they came to talk to my colleagues at Mass General to build it. And they said, you know, we've got this cool technique called bispectral analysis. You know, do you think we could use it on the electrocardiogram? That's what they said. And my colleague at the time, Lee Kearse, who's a neurologist, said, you know, I don't know anything about the electrocardiogram, but I do know a lot about the EEG, and maybe you could use it on that. So, okay, well, we care about that, so let's use it on the EEG. That's what happened. There was no... There was no sort of um, plan. And the bottom line is, you know, as I've shown you, we've had discussions about, so different drug, different signature, okay? And we can understand the neurophysiology and what that means in terms of relating to how anesthetized you are, what the level of arousal is, very tractable. It changes with age, which kind of makes sense, so we'll just learn how to do that. So there are more details that you have to use to do, use this paradigm I'm talking about, but they're all, they're all details that kind of jibe with our intuition as physiologists, and that's what we really want to be as anesthesiologists. We want, to, we want to adapt our thinking based on physiology, and not based on some epidemiologic convention that someone who didn't care about anesthesia is asking us to use. So I, I just think that, you know, do we have all the answers in this paradigm here? No, I don't. I, I'm, I'm the first to basically say that. But I can tell you, this is not going to disappear tomorrow, right? Because what happens, the one thing that happens every time you anesthetize your patients is the drugs make the brain oscillate. That you can see robustly. And those oscillations, the insights that we've gained is those oscillations are telling you the brain state. And now we have to work a little bit more to refine that and get that down pat. But that's going to be, I think, a robust way to think about monitoring the brain under anesthesia going on into the future. You're answering the question about this, and I agree with you with the original this. However, uh, I would also point out that the bilateral this put in a spectral array mode 
will show you essentially the same pictures that we've been, been showing up there. Right, so, so again, see the question was about BIS, the index. You're telling me about the spectrum. The spectrum and we're right, um, using the bilateral BIS machine. So spectrum, no matter how you get it, as long as you reasonably compute it. And we're in perfect agreement there on the spectrum. And the raw EEG. That's really key. Because one thing that I do is I go back and forth between the raw EEG and the spectrogram. On induction, I have it on the raw EEG. Because you can just see the oscillations change. Like, that di like the video I showed you. That's how I, so I can just see that. So, so the spectrogram and raw EEG, we're in total agreement. Guys, thank you.